Today is a special festival day, celebrating the teacher, the source of truth, the master, the guru. How do we become the guru? Well, the first step is gaining our self-realization, that connection, that union between the spirit inside each one of us and the great energy of creation that surrounds us. The connection of our life force with the love of God. Later in the program, we will be offering self-realization to each listener who desires it. And if self-realization is the first step, what's the second? Well, it's regular meditation which develops our balance, well-being, our health, and our depth of understanding. Sri Mataji often talks about the Adi Guru. This Adi Guru is the first teacher, the, the basic principle of Gurudom, as it were. It's a divine force, and it has, over the centuries, taken human birth ten times. All of us must, at some time, in some lifetime or other, make the journey from matter, from materialism, our involvement with the world around us and the problems of the day-to-day -day living, to the spirit. In terms of our energy centers, this is the journey from the muladhara, the base of the spine, our center of innocence, to the heart, the home of the spirit. And to make this journey, we have to pass through a very dangerous sea, a very dangerous area, the void, the stomach area, which in spiritual terms is called, in Sanskrit, the sea of illusion or the ocean of illusion. Well, in undertaking this journey from the world of illusion to, re to the reality of the spirit, the ten great incarnations of the Adi Guru, these ten great masters, can help us enormously. They are the navigators who chart the good journey across these dangerous, tempest-tossed, rocky and predator-infected seas of illusion. And these ten incarnations? Sri Janaka, Abraham, Moses, Zoroastra, Latsu, Confucius, Socrates, Muhammad, Guru Nanak, and Sai Baba of Shirdi. Janaka lived almost 10,000 years ago. Sai Baba of Shirdi, also known as Sai Nath, lived through the end of the 19th century and the early days of the 20th. Now, Sri Janaka, the first of our Adi Guru incarnations, he was a king of an Indian state. And King Janaka believed his wealth only existed so that he could support and preserve his people, especially through times of famine and flood and disease. The well-being of his subjects was one of his prime responsibilities. He taught that attention should always be upon God. When the focus is right, he said, when God and only God is in mind, joy and truth will follow. And he lived as he taught. Abraham and his tribe were nomads. 
they lived in tents, shepherding their herds through barren Middle Eastern lands to find pasture and water. Abraham became famous as the man who would invite all strangers to share his food and shelter. He was difficult to refuse, insisting that he needed people to join him in praising God. Abraham's dedication to the God too great to be named was so total and all-embracing that he was even willing, when divinely requested, to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. But of course Isaac was saved and with his father became one of the early definers of the Hebrew religion and culture. Abraham became a towering figure for Christians too as one of the most noble heroes of the Old Testament. But since one of his sons was exiled and achieved honor and fame among the neighboring Arabs, Abraham eventually took on a major Islamic role as well. So here he is now loved and honored among Jews, Christians and throughout Islam. And all love him for the same reason, his open-heartedness, his joy, his dignity, and his dedication to God. Moses, coming much later, had a very different and a very difficult job leading his people from their slavery in Egypt to the promised lands of the north. All the Adi Guru incarnations have power over water. That power was so strong in Moses that he was able to force back the waters of the Red Sea so the Jews could pass over. That journey north through harsh and inhospitable country lasted many, many years. And as time went on, many of those long-suffering refugees lost their faith and began desperately worshipping new and alien gods. It was then that Moses received from the divinity he was always so close to, virtually a part of, those rules, those laws, which would define Judaism and would become a key foundation of Christianity, the Ten Commandments. Four of these commandments outline man's responsibilities to God and the other six, man's responsibilities to man. Sadly, Moses never reached the Promised Land, but his Ten Commandments are as true today as they were those thousands of years ago when he received them. Adi Guru incarnation, in historical terms, is Zoroastra. We know very little about Zoroastra. But we do know that through his powers and the respect he earned, he was able to draw a number of battling Middle Eastern cities, satraps and tribes into a social and religious unity, replacing the many weird objects of worship 
with a single, great, glorious and ongoing Creator. He is remembered for the peace he brought to his world and the freedom in the heart that dedication to the Godhead can bring about. He is also remembered for the ways in which he encouraged a deeper understanding of God through the study and honouring of the elements that God used in his creation. Earth, air, water, fire and ether. Fire was an especially important element to Zoroaster, since as well as cooking and lighting, it could cleanse, purify and be used in worship. He lit fires throughout his world that have never gone out. And the next incarnation of the Adi Guru, Lao Tzu. Without staring abroad, one can know the whole world. Without looking out of the window, one can see the way to heaven. The further one goes, the less one knows. Therefore the sage knows without having to stir, identifies without having to see, accomplishes without having to act. These are the words of Lao Tzu. He taught that we, as human beings, are part of nature, part of God's creation, part of God's mystery, and that we live the good and valuable life only when we become part of that creation, part of God's will. We must, as it were, go with the flow. We must live with the seasons. We must hold fast to stillness. The myriad creatures all rise together. Still I watch them gather. Then the teeming creatures all return to their separate rooms. Returning to one's roots is known as stillness. Peace and goodness and nature and family are all one to Lao Tzu. Here's another quotation from him. The world had a beginning, and this beginning is the mother of the world. When you know the mother, go on to know the child. After you have known the child, go back to holding fast to the mother, and to the end of your days, you will not meet with danger. Lao Tzu, when he was a very old man, met Confucius, the other great Chinese prophet and guru. They didn't seem to have much in common. Lao Tzu warned the busy, overactive people of his world that the productive life lay in stillness. But Confucius taught the fearful, the heart-hiding, the insecure, that everybody had to find their place in life. Who we are responsible to and who we are responsible for. And we should live that life fully. He said there were eight principles. To investigate things. To expand knowledge. To be sincere. To rectify one's mind to cultivate oneself, 
to regulate one's family, to manage the state, to bring peace to the world. The wise, he said, are never confused. The benevolent are never worried. The courageous are never afraid. So between them, Lao Tzu and Confucius talked to the whole world. Lao Tzu gentling down the overactive and Confucian, Confucius motivating the fearful. Each of them helping to pull our sad left side and our busy right side to the balanced and still center. Attention is the point. If you are the Guru, where is your attention? If your attention is on the correction and the nourishment of yourself and of others, then you are first of all the Sajogi. And once you rise, above the gravitational force of materialism, then you could be called as the Guru. Anything that is living has a capacity to rise against the gravity up to a point. That is limited. Like we have seen the trees, they come out of the Mother Earth and grow upward, up to a limited space. Every tree, every type of tree has its own limitation. Siddhar will be Siddhar and rose will be a rose. Is all controlled by the gravitational force. But there is one thing which rises against the gravitational force which has no limits and that is your Kundalini. It cannot be controlled by the gravitational force unless and until you want it to be controlled. Nothing can control it but you and yourself can control it. So as soon as you become in charge of your Kundalini, you have crossed one step forward that you have, you have overcome the force that is the gravitational force.
Spiritus Sanctus, a song of praise of the Holy Ghost, the first power, the Adi Shakti, the mother of creation. The words are by Hildegard Bingham, and the music is by the Zephyr group who made the recording. Now to the seventh of the incarnations of the Adi Guru, the Greek philosopher Socrates. At an early date in the young philosopher's life, the oracle at Delphi, an unchallengeable, mystical, highly respected and feared voice, declared that no man was wiser than Socrates. Seeking to disprove the oracle, he set out to examine the beliefs and thinking of all those people who considered themselves wise. And this he did in a most amusing and entertaining way eventually decided the oracle was right. He was wiser than all he met, because, he said, he alone recognized his own ignorance. Only through the humility of ignorance, not through the distractions of opinion and conditionings, could be found the goodness, beauty, and truth of reality. So he encouraged everybody he met to start from scratch, admit their ignorance, and seek to understand the nature of God through the nature that God had created. Every man had a soul, Socrates believed, a spirit, and it was each man's duty to know that soul, that spirit. Knowing thyself was essential, he said. So everything had to be tested. We had to introspect. 
An unquestioned life is not worth living, he said. Happiness, he taught, is related not to wealth or power or reputation, but to living a life that is good for the soul, good for the spirit. And what is good for the spirit, he said, is learning to know the essence of goodness and beauty and truth. And he was eventually sentenced to death because he wouldn't compromise that truth. But he accepted it happily. Death was his entrance way to eternity. Forward now to the 6th century AD and the Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> This is the music of the Sufis, the dedicated, creative, and saintly followers of Muhammad. They are singing of their surrender to God, to Allah. Muhammad was surrounded by Shaktis, great women who supported him and from whom he drew his strengths. His mother, his stepmother, his two wives and his daughter Fatima were all very special people with divine powers. Each played a vital role in his ongoing spiritual work. In fact, it wasn't until Fatima had grown up that his amazing activities began. Muhammad was born into a country and a time when worship was focused upon idols of all kinds. Many strange gods took many strange forms in paint and stone and imaginations. One of the Prophet's first tasks was to destroy all those idols and set in their place the one God who was too great to be represented by any physical form, Allah. But it wasn't easy to dig the idolatry out of many of his fellow countrymen's minds. Scuffles became battles and battles became wars. A good deal of Muhammad's mature life was given over to fighting. Many men were killed in these battles, and since their widows had no security, no income, and often children to raise, Muhammad encouraged his followers to take a second and even third wife from amongst them. This gave the widows a respectable place in life and security for their children. Muhammad drew on the teachings of many earlier saints and incarnations. He had enormous respect for Abraham, of course, but also for Jesus Christ and his mother Mary, who figure frequently in the Quran, the book that was written with the help of the Archangel Gabriel. It was planned that his daughter and her husband, Hazrat Ali, would continue Muhammad's work at the end of his human life. But sadly, tensions that had never been far below the surface flared up again, this time over matters of leadership. Islam broke into sects, and those tensions that divided the early followers of Muhammad continue to this day in the frictions between the Shiites and the Sunnis. But although his name is often associated with fighting, Muhammad's teachings have always centered upon compassion, peace, dedication, and surrender to God. The ninth incarnation was Guru Nanaka. Guru Nanak was almost contemporary with Martin Luther. On each side of the world, in Europe and in India, there was a spiritual figure attacking what they saw as great social problems, over ornate religious rituals, forms of religious exploitations, social divisions, the class in the West and castes in the East. Guru Nanak, like Luther, went straight to the heart of the matter, the nature of the individual spirit and the importance of the collective will. 
Against the practices of his day, Nanaka gathered around him large numbers of people who lived as a group, growing their own food, cooking meals for all, joining together in daily worship of God, singing to him bright, rhythmic and heart-warming songs of praise. He taught of the simple and direct relationship with the divine, both individually and collectively. Sai Baba of Shirdi, the last of the ten great incarnations of the Adi Guru, also lived in India. Born in the late 1800s, he was a foundling. No one knew whether he was of Muslim or Hindu parentage. He didn't either, he said. So he spent his life without ties to any traditions or cultures or customs. He taught and showed that the worship of God didn't depend on established attitudes or rituals, and these teachings drew to him peoples from all religions, including Christianity and Buddhism, people who found they could unbind themselves of the historical and family trappings, just as Guru Nanak had done 400 years earlier. These ten great saints talk to their own peoples in their own individual ways, with their own individual voices, the basic spiritual truths. Different words, different clothes, different places, but the same truths, as true today as they have been over thousands of years. Now, self-realization and regular meditation is the way for our age to gain, as part of life, the truths these great men lived and taught. But you should always remember that with that humility you must have your dignity intact, because you are a guru. Once you know you are a guru, one thing should be there that you will not behave like a joker all the time. Your behavior will be dignified. At the same time, it would be very pleasant face or a pleasant personality. It won't be annoying time. Your personality itself will suggest that there's something special about you. Now how do you develop that kind of a personality? The biggest problem in the West is ego, and the biggest problem in the East is super-ego. Now this ego business, I don't know from where it has come. In all walk of life, they show how egoistical they are. For example, I went to America and I was surprised that there, are, there is a racial problem and the blacks are treated in a different manner and the whites in a different manner. I mean, color is given by God and somebody has to be black and white. If everybody looked the same, it will look like a regiment. There should be some variety, there should be some uh, change in the face and also in the expression. One has to be a person carrying better or different expressions. Otherwise, you will be bored with such a world where there is everybody looks the same, just the same. But so much of racialism there that I was surprised that how uh, it has worked into human mind. So as a guru, you must develop a complete detest for racialism, complete detest. It's very easy to understand that anybody who has fair complexion could be a cruelest man, cruelest woman, and could be a cruelest mother also. 
and the one who is black would be very kind generous it doesn't go with the color temperament doesn't go with the color but because the blacks have been irritated so much that they react and they react naturally in sometimes in such a manner that it is very crude and very cruel but this kind of attention this kind of a we can say a wrong type of attitude towards human beings even towards animals they won't bear it so towards human beings to have such an attitude itself shows that you are not worthy of such yoga so anyone of who has such a feeling that somebody is black or somebody is white cannot be a guru in such yoga then in india we have caste system equally bad and horrible it has no sense in it is no basis also but in india we have people who believe that some castes are higher and some castes are lower every caste people can do all the worst possible things there is no demarcation for them and every low caste can be very very good we have had many great poets and sufis in the lowest caste in india this caste sar man made you know man made cloth doesn't suit us and all these man made ideas are not going to suit us and it will lead us to a great dis uh i would know the description but i would say to a complete destruction because hatred begets hatred and it goes on increasing and increase if you cannot get rid of your hatred then i would say you are not a surgeon these are all conditionings you are born in a uh, white family so you are white you are born in a christian family that's why you are christian you are born in a jew family that's why you are jew all this is just because you are born in that but does that mean that you are higher or lower all the problems of the world today if you see are because of human attachment to nonsensical ideas of superiority only through collective living will change for example i would say a in an ashram we should have all colored people living together with the equal rights with the equal uh, understanding and love and affection if that is not there no use calling it an ashram once uh, they asked me mother uh, will you come and give a lecture in harlem i said why not so some surgeon said harlem mother what do you know what is harlem is as i know it's no harm he said you know the blacks are there and they... i said i am also black you could call me black or you can call me white but the love is such a thing is love is such a thing that cleanses all these ridiculous ideas we have about other people to brand anyone as black and white shows that you have no eyes to see any person with depth any person with loving heart cannot see these superficial things cannot see today is a day where we are celebrating the gurus greatness now look at all the gurus how they were how they behave uh we have many in india and many others many sufis in other countries 
these sufis or these saints that we had never believed in any caste system never believed in black and white christ he never believed in black and white buddha never believed in black and white nobody believed in any kind of man made ideas these are all man made ideas which we have accepted and even after realization we try to carry on with them now by saying we do not get rid of it but acting with them just see how we work out these stupid ideas within us and how we can get rid of them very simply is in meditation you should sit down and see how many people you love and why do you love not out of pity but just with love how much you care for others i have seen some very beautiful examples of that but still i must say that there are certain fixed ideas which are to be dislodged completely very important for every person who is a guru in such means he has to be a clean hearted open hearted loving hearted fellow his heart should play the tune of param chaitanya For those listeners who desire their self-realization, it's a very simple process. Can I suggest you slip your shoes off, sit comfortably on the floor or on a chair, keep the spine straight, but no effort in it, and the head sitting. in a relaxed way on the top of the spine very easy very comfortable what we'll be doing is we'll be placing the or the we'll be turning the hands upward on the lap just put the hands onto the lap turning them upward palm upward then we'll be taking the right hand and putting up on various points various energy centers on the left hand side and encouraging them to open to fulfill their functions with some affirmations which we just say quietly to ourselves So first leaving the left hand palm upward on the lap take the right hand and put it on the heart on the left hand side of the sternum bone on the heart and here quietly ask inside ourselves mother am i the spirit the mother is the kundalini in us the life force energy that energy which makes the connection and gives us our self realization our union our yoga so here the first question is mother am i the spirit Now take the right hand down to the top of the stomach just underneath the rib cage there tuck the fingers firmly in under the rib cage on the left hand side And here the question is very appropriate to today 
Mother, am I my own guru? Am I my own master? Ask this question a few times. Now take the right hand down to that point where the, the body meets the left leg. Just tuck it in there. And this is the, actually the center of our knowledge, of our understanding. And here we ask, Mother, Mother Kundalini, please give me the pure knowledge. Shri Mother, please give me pure knowledge. This takes us away from any other extraneous thoughts attitudes, anything attacking our attention. Mother, please give me pure knowledge. Now once that energy starts to flow, what we can do is to encourage that energy to flow. So take the hand back up again to the top of the stomach, and tucking the fingers underneath the rib cage. And here we can endorse, we can affirm, Mother, I am my own guru. Say this quietly a few times. Mother, I am my own guru. Take the right hand now onto the heart. Again, just on the left hand side. And here again, endorsing with confidence. Mother, I am the spirit. Mother, I am the spirit. Now with the left hand still, palm up put on the lap, take the right hand into the corner between the shoulder and the neck on the left hand side. And and turn the head a little to the right. So with the hand there, the shoulder and the neck. Here we have to challenge our sense of guilt. Guilt is one of those problems that somehow dog us through life. We start to feel guilty about everything. But guilt gets in the way of the flow of Kundalini. So here, what we say is, 
Mother, I am not guilty. Mother, I am not guilty at all. Again, with confidence. Shaking off that block that can get in the way of our Kundalini's and our self-realization. Mother, I am not guilty. One of the other big problems in the West is our lack of forgiveness. And this can also block the flow of Kundalini. So now take the right hand and place it across the forehead, fingers on one side, thumb on the other, holding the forehead reasonably firmly. And here make a statement with the totality of the being. Mother, I forgive everyone. Mother, I forgive. I forgive everyone. Nothing specific. Just the open-hearted act of forgiveness. I forgive. And take the hand to the back of the head, placing the palm on the bump at the back of the head, again holding firmly, and here just a little prayer to the Divine. If I have made any mistakes, knowingly or unknowingly, in my seeking of the truth, please forgive me. If I have made any mistakes, knowingly or unknowingly, in my search for the truth, please forgive me. Finally, place the hand firmly on the top of the head, the palm on that bone that was soft in childhood, the fontanelle bone, and actually push it quite firmly and move the scalp in a sort of clockwise direction. And here the request is, Mother, Please give me my self-realization. Mother, please grant me my self-realization. For those of you who have your realization already, Mother, please deepen my self-realization. Holding the hand a few inches above the head, see if you can feel the energy that is being produced by Kundalini. You can often feel it, the sort of whisper of energy on the palm of the hand, just Hold it a few inches above the head. That is the connection. And if you don't feel it now, then you will, after some days of meditation. Now, just sit quietly with the hands on the lap, the attention above the head, the heart and being in the quiet stillness.
that's the program for today. We wish you good meditation and good times. <laughs>